So uh, first of all, I want you to have your little handout out. You'll notice uh, gra our graphic artist, man, you just look at this thing. These things are beautiful. Uh, and we're doing these. So our, our congregational graphic artists are putting these together weekly. Um, this one, you can see how they've done this picture. I think uh, our friend Victor Minatola down at ULC made this one. Um, and you're going to look inside. So we're gonna, I'm going to talk about this later in the message, so be ready for it. And you'll see inside a prayer for the week and some sermon notes. Uh, and then on the back, when you go home, taking worship home, uh, there's something you can do at home using this so it can go, it has some life beyond Sunday morning here. Uh, so have this ready. I'm going to talk about it in a few minutes. Um, I, I think it's obvious to note, and I'm going to give you just a very obvious thing, and you're going to go, well, yeah, that's a no-brainer. Uh, the very obvious thing that to note, that we live in a world of conflict. Does that make sense? Don't we live in a world of conflict? Every time you go on the highway, on the road, at home, uh, there's a world of conflict. Uh, in fact, what I always find striking is uh, you don't have to teach people to live in conflict or to embrace conflict. It's who they are. You go, well, what do you mean? You take a family. Now, how many of you come from a family? Oh, you all do. You come from a family. Now, I'm going to tell you what I discovered in my family is, uh, and I don't know where it came from, but my brother and I would just duke it out. I mean, we just, he was a bad person. And, and so when I grew up, my brother, who's a year and a half younger than I am, we would duke it out and we would fight. And my mother would yell at us and she would call us Cain and Abel. That was her language. You are so much like Cain and Abel. And, and then I started thinking, then I had my own children. And I started raising our own little girls. And we had a beautiful little baptism. The little baby held here. We did all this. We did it. And at my, my uh, youngest daughter's baptism, my oldest daughter decided to have a moment at the baptismal font. Now, did we teach her that? No. We didn't teach her at three years old to do a, a behavior that was not healthy for a baptism moment. In fact, one of our friends, we were in Baltimore at that time, one of our friends in Baltimore came over to the side door of the sanctuary and I was taking my daughter Emily to the side door and I opened it up and there was my friend, unbeknownst to me, because we were going to have to do something, because there was a moment. Did we teach our daughter that? No. You who have raised children, you have raised them in wonderfully healthy homes. And then they start fighting. Did you teach them to fight? No, you didn't teach them to fight. It's who they are. They're filthy sinners. Even little cassettes. It's all in her, Paul. It's just a matter of time. Wait till they start duking it out. Do we have to teach people conflict? We don't. It's who we are. And that's an important word because when we look at how we deal with uh, the, con the conflicts that we have in our life today, our natural inclination already is to live in a conflicted world. That's why the story that we have today with Jesus is so interesting to me. Because when I look at this story, well known from the Gospel of Mark, about uh, a, a conflict that took place in the midst of a miracle that was happening, Jesus didn't avoid conflict. Just so you all understand that, he didn't avoid conflict. He would take conflict on. In fact, what Jesus would do is he would choose one to challenge and one to engage conflict. He just didn't needlessly get into conflict. And sometimes I think, I know I do it, and I bet you do it as well. Sometimes we just get into things and we think, why did I ever get into that? You think, why did I ever do that? We create the conflict. Jesus didn't do that. What Jesus did, he, he chose when to challenge and when to engage in conflict. And when he does engage in conflict, he always does it for a reason. He has an intention. He wasn't just trying to annoy people. And I think sometimes when we do conflict, we're just trying to be annoying. But Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus goes into the conflict with an intention and a reason, and that's what brings us to our Mark story. Jesus is teaching in a home in the town of Capernaum. In fact, if you go to Capernaum today, what you'll find out is it's not an active city anymore. It's a ruin. And they've dug up all of the, the part of the city. They've dug it all up because it was covered by debris. And you get a pretty good picture of what the city looked like, the little town looked like. These towns were made out of stone because that was their most readable 
uh, resource. It was the thing most easily found. And they built these houses out of limestone, in fact, and they built little homes, and they would be attached homes, and then there would be a very narrow street and then some more homes on the other side. So you'd have neighbor, 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 neighbor. And so when there was talking, laughing, fighting, whatever went on in your home, the other, your neighbors could always hear it. It was, a, it was just the way people lived. The homes typically had a doorway, one entrance, and they had a small window. So there wasn't much light in the rooms. And then on the outside, as they're attached, in between the homes, there would be a stairway that would go up. And the stairway would take you to the roof of the house. And that would be additional living space, kind of like we would have with a basement today. They'd put it on the roof of their home. And so you had these homes that were always attached together and uh, very close with a stairway in between. And they would go up to their patio where they would have their living. That's the picture of what's going on. Now, we get a, what happens in the text, we're told that Jesus goes into one of these small homes... And, and, and it says that so many people gathered in the home that they spilled out of the door, that one door, they spilled out onto the street. And they were there all to hear Jesus teach. Now I'm going to tell you, the streets are very narrow, so they probably filled up the whole street and people were trying to have to walk through it. But they wanted to hear Jesus speak in this little home. And so Jesus begins to teach, and while he's doing that, there's, there's guys who heard that Jesus was there. And they had a relative, it, it would seem a relative, uh, certainly a good friend, that was a paralytic, was paralyzed. And they put him on a stretcher, they call it a mat in the, in the text, and they're carrying him. These four men, they each have a corner of this, this stick that they would carry this guy, and they got to the house and the easy way the easy way was to go through the front door right but sometimes life isn't easy you ever felt that in your life sometimes life just isn't easy and so they were forced because of the large crowd to do the more complicated journey and I can imagine the conversation that took place when they arrived at the house and they see the people spilling out into the street and now I can see them all talking to each other Ira what are we going to do now? Jacob, I have no idea what we're going to do right now. They took a moment. One of, them, one of them takes leadership. He goes, there's the stairway. We'll go up the stairs. What are we going to do? We'll figure it out when we get up there. All right, let's go, Ira. And they go up the stairway. They get up to the top of the stairs, and they go on the little patio, and then it occurs to them they could just rip the guy's roof apart. Now, how would you feel about that? And they do that. Now, there were big beams in the roof, and what they did, these beams were put together by mud. They put beam, beam, mud, mud, and then they put straw on top of the mud, and that's how they would live up on the roof. And so they ripped this thing apart. Now, I always think to myself, what's going on down below? Well, Jesus is teaching, and there's chunks of mud falling down. That gets in the way of teaching. Straw starts falling down. That gets in the way of teaching. There were crowds, in, a small crowd in the room. We know there were some religious, very, very religious people. They were called Pharisees. All right, they were the pastors of the day. And they were pretty judgmental guys. And they were pretty self-righteous guys. They were pastors. And then what would happen is they're looking at that. And you know when roof stuff starts falling into the room... Those guys are going to be annoyed because this is inconvenient. Jesus kind of goes with it. He just kind of goes. He looks up, oh yeah, hi. But the Pharisees, they're not going to be nearly as amiable to that. This is an inconvenient moment. They're trying to listen to Jesus teach because they want to entrap Jesus. Because you see, for Jesus, and this is really important, and I, mom and dads, I, I just think we underestimate this. Every moment for Jesus is a teachable moment. Every moment for Jesus is always a teachable moment. Mom and dads, I'm just going to tell you, every moment's a teachable moment. How you live, how you take naps, how you talk to people, how you eat dinner, how you engage with people on the phone. All of those are teachable moments, and they're done just naturally by the way you live. If you're a person of character, you teach of good character, I should say. If you're a person of good character, that's what your children figure out. If you're a person of bad character, that's what they figure out. If you are a faithful man or woman of God, you're committed to who your faith is, you're committed to who Jesus Christ is in your life, then your parents, your children will see that and your children will understand that this is a high value. It just is every moment is a teachable moment. You can't get away from it. And the other part to it is, are parents perfect? Say no. 
That was said quietly. Uh, so, so we're not perfect people, and so we make mistakes. So then our children find out, how do we manage our mistakes? How do we manage those areas where we just fumble? Areas where mom and dads create conflict. Or James Dobson said one time years ago, listen to a radio program, he said, the danger of parenting, he says, is not that we walk with our children through the rapids. We always are going to have to walk with our children through the rapids. He said, what we do is we parents create a waterfall. So we go through the rapids, but then we exasperate the problem and we create rapids that turn into a waterfall. Mom and dads, what children need to know is how you reconcile and how you forgive, how you, how you own your problem when you do the problem. That's what they need to see. For Jesus, every moment's a teachable moment. For us, every moment is a teachable moment. We can't get away from it. It's always there. So Jesus takes this moment. The four guys open up the roof. Paralytic, of course, he just hangs around. And notice this, the paralytic is kind of passive in all this. Just so you all know, he doesn't have much, he never says anything. He's just kind of hauled around. They rip the roof apart, and then somehow they lower him down. They don't just toss him. They lower him down from the roof, the eight feet or so, down to the floor. And now the guy's laying there. There's a hole in the roof. I, the other thing I think is funny, what are the four guys doing? They're looking down through the hole. I just think the whole scene is really, really funny. So they rip the guy's roof apart. They put the guy down on the floor. They lower him down. And then Ira and Jacob and the buddies, they're all looking down going, hey, Jesus, do something. Just do something. We're watching. This is a good time. What are we going to do? Do something. Jesus does something. I think he, he really took them off guard. Jesus looks at the man, and you know what his first words are? Your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. Something inside of this paralyzed, paralytic man was something was broken and something was lost, and it wasn't his physical body. That was the surface of it all. Jesus goes right to the heart of the matter. Jesus saw in this man, and I think this is an important word, Jesus saw in this man the loss of grace. And maybe he lived in self-pity. Maybe he lived in victimization. I am just, just don't have any place to go. You know, people do that. You know, we all do that. We try to play victim. Uh, and maybe he just lived in a self-righteousness that I deserve to be taken care of. Whatever the condition was, Jesus saw this. And I want, I want you to hear this comparison. Do we live by grace? Where we have unconditional love, no judgment, no, no conditions on relationships? Or do we live by ungrace? Ungrace is that part of us which actually says that we do live by condition, we do live by judgment, we do live by, uh, by being victims and blaming that the world's out to try, try to get me. Which side of the continuum do you want to live? Gracefulness or ungracefulness? Which side do you want? And I'm going to tell you, we live in a world of ungrace. And so it's easy to take on conflict and to point the finger and say, they did that to me, and to play the victim. That's really, really easy, because it's, we're wired that way. That's why we don't have to tell children how to fight. We have to tell them how to love. We have to show them grace, because they already embrace on grace. It's how they're wired. That's called sin. They're already broken, because we're broken. So we're trying to teach them what does it mean to be graceful. And that's a godly endeavor. That's the essence of what our faith is about, is to teach people what it means, that we, we, what it means to live in a graceful, non-judgmental, non-condition, and it, uh, non-judgmental, non-victim, non-blaming, that we live in a world where we're freely loved and freely cared for. That's what forgiveness does. Real forgiveness goes right into the soul. It goes right into the heart. Real forgiveness transforms a person. But if you look at your handout, pull out your handout. 
Which, by the way, I think they do a great job with this graphic of the man being lowered down through the roof. I, I just think this is a wonderful thing to it. And you're going to see in the inside five blanks. I'm going to fill in four. And you can, if you're one of those people that loves to fill in blanks, this is your moment. Now, there are different kinds of conflicts that we all wrestle with. And, and you're going to see them all in the story. The first one that we actually see is that we see Jesus versus sin. He says, your sins are forgiven, which means that even this paralyzed guy who looked like life had just messed him up, that he had sinful stuff going on inside that needed to be forgiven. There was a conflict between Jesus and sin. We see that there's a conflict between Jesus and sickness. Sickness is an outcome of a broken, sinful world. God's yearning is not that we have can cancer. God's yearning is that we that we not have congestive heart failure. That's what my mother died of. That's not God's desire, but it is the product of a sinful and broken world. Jesus has trouble, Jesus versus the Pharisees is another one. Jesus versus legalism. Jesus versus work righteousness. That's the Pharisees' language. And that means, what it means is that we live faith by rules. And if you live faith by rules, then it's not faith. And yet, in many, many ways, we live in a whole world that always wants to take our formula as believers in Jesus and craft it into a formula of rules. So the Bible becomes a guidebook and not the story of salvation. And finally, the last conflict is you'll see Jesus versus self-righteousness. The Pharisees were self-righteous. They felt that they, they had it all figured out. And they don't have it all figured out. So we see a Jesus who attacks sin and sickness. He attacks religious formulism and legalism and the Pharisees and then self-righteousness. And each of these conflicts push us away from God and they give us an excuse for self-promotion because in all four of those things, do we wrestle with all four of those things? Yes, we do. And we like to say we don't. We like to point the finger and say, well, that's not my problem. But we wrestle with all four of these things, each one of us. And they can separate us from receiving the forgiveness that Jesus wants to freely offer us. They get in the way, the roadblocks. Now, our friend Christine Dara wrote a blog this week that I really want you to go and read. And I read it yesterday. And Christine's blog... Boy, it really, really provoked me. And I'm going to quote a part of her blog to you because she wrestles with this question as she's walking into the new year. The stuff that gets in the way of her knowing Jesus. And this is what Christine writes. My prayer isn't that I accomplish more or check off an in interminable list, but that God would continue to convict me. Showing me, here, catch this, Showing me the places where darkness reigns in my heart and my mind. And giving me the courage to shine a light of honesty into the deepest secret spaces. Together with the Holy Spirit, cleaning a house which needs it. So that I can be, catch this, in authentic community with people around me but also so that I can extend the same grace which I've received over and over to those around me in order that the nature of Jesus can shine through me. Isn't that a great quote? We all have this stuff, this dark stuff in the house that has to be cleaned up. It has to, because we live in this world of ungrace, but if you live in this world, if this is your battle, can ungrace give you grace? Say no. Say, I mean it, say no. Yeah, yeah, because folks, this is where we live. We live by rules and formulas, and you better get good grades. Because you've got to go to the right school, so you have the right life. That's an ungraced world. It just breeds competition. And then you're trying to you live in this ungraceful world, and what we're trying to teach is what is gracefulness? What does it mean to be graceful? To live by the forgiveness of a Jesus Christ who died for us, no condition, no expectation, because he simply loves you. Simply loves you. But on grace cannot give you grace. And that's why we come here. We come here so we hear that word of grace. 
Because on grace, hear this, does not win. The power of Jesus Christ destroyed on grace and brought us to grace. It brought us to grace. Forgiveness always changes people. To have a glimpse of forgiveness, to just have a, a glimpse of it, it, is to have a taste of grace. And what I've noticed is when people taste grace, when they taste it, they never want to let alone. They always want to have more. Because they live in such an ungrace world that the minute they taste any grace, they just want to grab it and hold on to it. And say, give me more, give me more, give me more. Because they feel such judgment. Such judgment. Now you'll remember, you who are my age, and there's a couple of you, you'll remember that in the, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, there was a major conflict in Ireland. And the major conflict in Ireland was between, in Northern Ireland, was between the Irish Catholics and the Irish Protestants. And the battle that took place between the Irish Catholics and the Irish Protestants had been gone on for, frankly, hundreds of years. But it really escalated in the 20th century. And it became horrendously bad, a horrific story in Ireland. And, uh, and I want to read you a little story of a guy who walked from ungrace to grace that came out of the story of something that happened in Ireland. In 1987, an, R, an R, IRA, that was the Irish Republican Army, bomb went off in a small town west of Belfast. And it blew up amid a, a, a group of Protestants who had gathered to honor the war dead on Veterans Day. Eleven people died. Sixty-three other people were wounded. What made this act of terrorism stand out from so many others was the response of one of the wounded. His name was Gordon Wilson. Don't forget that name, Gordon Wilson. Gordon was a devout Methodist who had immigrated, from, uh, immigrated north from the Irish Republic in the south to work as a draper. That day, the bomb exploded, and the bomb buried Wilson and his 20-year-old daughter, under five feet of concrete and brick. These were the last words of his daughter, Marie. Grasping her father's hand in this debris and under five feet of concrete, she simply says this, Daddy, I love you very much. And she never spoke again. She suffered severe spinal and brain injuries. They did get her out of the debris, got the man out of the, deb the, the debris, and he died a few hours later in the hospital. A newspaper later proclaimed, no one remembers what the politicians had to say at that time. No one who heard Gordon Wilson will ever forget what he confessed. His grace towered over the miserable justifications of the bombers. They lived in on grace. Speaking from his hospital bed, Wilson said, I have lost my daughter, but I bear no grudge. Bitter talk is not going to bring Marie Wilson back to life. I shall pray tonight and every night that God will forgive them. His daughter's last words of love were of love. And Gordon Wilson determined to live out his life on that plane of love. And the world wept, said one report, as Wilson gave interview after interview, and even one on BBC Radio in England. The world wept. After his release from the hospital, Gordon Wilson led a crusade for Protestant Catholic reconciliation. Protestant extremists who had planned to avenge the bombing decided because of the publicity surrounding uh, Wilson that such a behavior would be politically foolish. He stopped other people from being killed by grace. Wilson wrote a book about his daughter. He spoke out against violence. And he constantly repeated the refrain, this refrain, love is the bottom line. He met with the IRA, the Irish Republican Army, and he personally forgave them for what they had done and asked them to lay down their arms. 
I know that you've lost loved ones just like me, he told them. Surely enough is enough. Enough blood has been spilled. The Irish Republic ultimately made Wilson a member of its Senate. When he died in 1995, the Irish Republic, Northern Ireland, and all of Great Britain honored this ordinary Christian citizen who had gained fame for his uncommon spirit of grace and forgiveness. His spirit exposed by contrast the violent deeds of retaliation and his life of peacemaking came to symbolize the craving for peace within many others who would never, never make the headlines. That's grace living. On grace, retaliation, revenge, another bomb. Grace, grace says, I will die for you and I will forgive. I will forgive. Jesus looks at the Pharisees because they questioned how could he forgive? What right does he have to forgive? And Jesus looks at the Pharisees and he says, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, to bring grace. He turns to the paralytic. I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. <laughs> I just see Jacob and Ira and the buddies looking up in the hole, looking down. Well, that's interesting. He forgave sins. Then there's an argument. And then he says to our buddy, stand up and walk. We're not told if anybody reached out a hand and helped him up. We're not told any of that. We're told that he got up. And he picked up, I, I love that. He didn't leave the mat. That was his bed. He picked up all the stuff, and then he broke through the crowd that blocked the door. And he went out into the street where the people were all standing. And you know when he got away from the crowd? You know what I think he did? I think he started doing a lot of jumping. He started doing a lot of dancing. I think he started screaming, praise God for life. Praise God for grace. Praise God for Jesus. I don't want us to live in the ungrace world. It never breeds anything good. If that voice is in you, pray this day, Jesus, fill me, kill the ungrace. Judgment. Perfectionism. Legalism. Follow rules. Jesus, take that away. Jesus, fill me with grace. Let me be Gordon Wilson. Let me be a world changer. Just me. Let me be a world changer. In Christ's name, amen.